Um, as we move on today, we're continuing to journey through the Ten Commandments, kind of taking a page and looking at that again. And it's, it is to move us away from a thought that it's, it's not just, it's old, right? It's ancient, but it's not archaic. It's not something that doesn't have value anymore. It's not just a blip in the Old Testament that we just kind of peruse over. It's a guiding way of how God's chosen people would live their lives, both in relationship to God and in relationship with one another. And so when we're taking a look at the Ten Commandments today, we move on to Thou shalt not murder, or no murder as the message says today. And I really wanted to take a look at this because so many times we either artistically stylize or we take a different uh, interpretation of Scripture, or like for when I got here, my office here uh, in the life of the church had the Uber Ten Commandments. And it was kind of, you know, it was kind of silly. It had some of the languages in there and kind of things. And it said something like, uh, don't want stuff your kids got, you know. And, and it, was, it was neat and it was funny. But sometimes we misunderstand this commandment as we read it as thou shalt not kill. But sometimes it takes us in different directions. I want us to look at in that Hebrew text of the original language, the original audience, the original dialect, when this was given, was translated into, not thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not take human life intentionally. Can we see the difference? Thou shalt not kill, or thou shalt not take a human life intentionally. So let us have that on our, our minds today as we walk through uh, this section of Scripture. Now, of course, today's message is going to hinge on this one verse. You shall not murder. Thou shall not murder. We shall not murder. We shall not kill. Take another human life intentionally. And I wanted to back that up for a second. Uh, when we're also looking at the first five uh, chapters of the Bible from Leviticus 19, uh, verse 8, that says this. Oh, well, maybe I wrote it down wrong. Let me see here. Did I write it down wrong? Nope, I did not. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. And we're going to take a little bit of a look at what Jesus says when he's reinterpreting how we need to take a look at this. But first and foremost, God's people were called that if we want to live in right relationship with God, we would value his creation. If we want to live in right relationship with other, we wouldn't intentionally take a life that is sacred of another human being. And so here when we read this, it says, we shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, because that love is not only for yourself, but the same love that you have for yourself should be extended to your neighbor, which is a very encompassing thing that would take a whole series of messages for us to understand. <coughs> but I hope that we get the rest of what that's saying. It's pretty tall. It's pretty intentional. And so when we're looking at the Old Testament, the first couple books of the Bible here, we can also see that after the fall in the garden, we can see one of the ancient, age-old sins, right? One of the first chronological sins is murder. We can see it from the first children of Adam and Eve in Cain and Abel. We can see that it wasn't by accident. It wasn't by happenstance. Cain was angry. Cain was jealous. Cain plotted to kill intentionally his brother. And I want us to take back to that moment just to see how long in the history of all creation do we see that murder was a problem. Murder was very close chronologically in the original sin, as is our scripture that gives us today. And so I want us to think about this for a moment because a lot of what Jesus, when we look at those scriptures from Matthew chapter 5, it's going to reveal to us what Jesus said leads to, most often, murder, the intentional taking of one's life. So when we're looking at this, I want us to, to understand if we've ever said a phrase like this or if we've ever heard someone say a phrase like this. Sometimes in response to something that we've done, right, like, um, Breaking the law is breaking the law, isn't it? I struggled with this one as a kid because we grew up in a small town very similar to this that we had a habit of jaywalking. Still against the law, was it? But we had a habit of jaywalking. And my dear pal Bill would point that out every single time that we did it. And I remember a few of us, because we were good church-going kids, that said, 
Well, at least we're not killing anybody. Have you ever heard something like that that sort of excuses a behavior that says, well, at least we're not killing anybody. At least we didn't murder anybody. And I found an interesting statistic when I was taking a look at some children's uh, ministry initiatives in the life of our conference that a question to be posed to all of us was, how many murders have we seen ourselves with our own eyes this week? Uh, first, we might wrinkle our nose and go, well, no, most of us probably have not. Are you sure? Do any of us watch CSI? Lord knows it's what is it, 20 seasons? So I think all of us have seen it at some point. Are there any shows on television that we watch that we've witnessed a murder? It might be fictional, but we've witnessed it. How many times, sometimes, in some of our greatest shows, our greatest movies, what's the biggest trigger for our hero to take up the mantle of hero and save the day and they play the, the heroic music? Because someone in their life dies, right? They're killed by the bad guy, the villain. And I'm not saying that movies necessarily or, or video games or any of those other medias are bad and evil in and of themselves, but I just should understand that we should take to heart. It's not just us, it's what we absorb. It's sometimes if it stops carrying meaning, the weight of human life. Sometimes it's, we have to take to heart that there could be an opportunity that we're not sensitive to the loss of human life anymore. We just have to make sure that we're doing a good job of separating what's in our hearts versus those other things. I wanted to share with us this moment from uh, Exodus chapter 21, verses 12 uh, through 14. Whoever strikes a person mortally shall be put to death. If it is not premeditated, but came about by an act of God, then I will appoint you a place to which the killer may flee. But if someone willfully attacks and kills another by treachery, you shall take the killer from my altar for execution. Whoa! <coughs> and that again comes to that moment. Can we hear those words and just understand what God's saying, the laws of God's people, didn't say about killing in general, said about intentionally taking another person's life. Because the scope of what we're talking about today, there are two big issues that I wonder if people are, are asking about today, are wondering if Pastor's going to talk about. And so I wanted to highlight those things, but because of brevity, and because even if we had 30 minutes together, it's a one-way conversation, and sometimes those bigger things we should unpack in a conversation. But there's a question about war. By very definition, lives will be lost. And usually there are instruments carried that intentionally are meant to, to kill other human beings. There is a whole interpretation and understanding of war in Scripture. There are even times when God has called His people to go against other human beings. This is a conversation that if anyone would like to have, I would courageously enjoy having that conversation with you. But it needs to become something that we dialogue about, not something that I tell you and we lose or we get frustrated and we miss. Can we understand that together that some things are best talked about between us instead of a one-way conversation? I hope you value that. Because today's message, along with the message of the Ten Commandments, is really the value of other people. Now, Jesus took us in a different direction. This might be a little bit more familiar with, other than the one simple verse that says, Thou shalt not murder. It comes from Matthew chapter 5, and it goes on in this beautiful, uh, the Beatitudes, right? The Sermon on the Mount that's here. And this says, Concerning anger. Chapter 5, verse 21, Jesus is going on in the greatest sermon that's ever recorded, and he says this, You have heard that it was said in ancient times, you shall not murder. And I can almost see people like, got this one, let's wait till he moves on to something else. I got it. I've never hurt anybody, never killed anybody, and that one's fine. But Jesus says, before you turn off your hearing aids, whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you in verse 22 that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable for judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable 
liable to the fires of hell. Real quick, I'm not going to ask for any hands, but have we ever called someone a name that wasn't the name on their birth certificate? Mm -hmm. Or like an abbreviation of that name? Wow. If we are not to murder, to intentionally kill another human being, to intentionally take their life, Jesus is saying that very first murder between Cain and Abel, it was only possible because of the anger and the sin and the jealousy that was welling up in Abel's or in Cain's life. And reminded us that we all should be living our lives differently and show the price of anger can lead to bitterness and jealousy and anger can morph into so many things that it can get us visualizing hurting someone else. It can get us visualizing daydreaming about what would happen if something happened to someone else. Our anger, if not transformed through the cross of Christ, our anger can lead us to unfathomable things. It reveals to us what we're capable of. My dear friends, unfortunately all of us are capable of hurting one another. Herman. So when you're offering a gift to the altar, Jesus goes on to say, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift to the altar and go first be reconciled with them, and then come back and offer your, your gift. Be quick to come to terms with those that you have an argument with, so that the accursed may go away from you, and you will not be judged. Jesus is saying, in the greatest sermon that we see <laughs> Place this scripture for us, a full and comfortable Jesus takes the time to say, We are capable of unfathomable things. That we have to be changed from the inside out because we are all prone to anger, bitterness, and jealousy. And that we don't lead it to be something it doesn't need to be because we can smile and inside be like, well, I got a something for you. And Jesus says, we've already intentionally hurt a brother or sister. I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of it too often. It's a serious prayer in my life. Have any of you ever had that moment in your life when you've pictured something or you've become angry about something and you've dwelled on it too long you find yourself thinking about it too often. Boy, we certainly hope that they get what's coming to them in our minds, right? And we hope that God gives it to them. Then I also wonder how many times have we been shown mercy when we've had stuff coming to us. I'm talking like justified coming to us stuff. And we've been shown mercy. Someone else in their heart has been looking at us and those that we love going, I hope God gives what's coming to them in full. Scripture says that if we call somebody a fool, then we will inherit the fires of hell. That's what's coming to us. Thank God for mercy. I mean, I'm not a guy that's going to stand on CBN, Christian Broadcast Network, and say, Can I get an amen? But, friends, are you thankful for mercy? Are you thankful for forgiveness? Are you thankful for unconditional love? That even if we had something coming to us, the Lord said, But I love you, and I am the God of second chances. I'm thankful that God loves me beyond myself. And loves me beyond what I do or sometimes even what I think. Sometimes even in my heart. And Jesus reminds us that we are called to remember the Ten Commandments, to remember ourselves as valuing people. God didn't come to set the scales right and then walk away so we would all learn a lesson. 
God sent His only Son, right, to show us the way because He valued people. He valued us and He showed us the way to love one another sacrificially, to love one another past a mistake, to show value to one another. And my dear friends, the Ten Commandments reminds us the value of how we need to live with God and the value of how we live and treat one another. And as Jesus reminds us, we have to master our hearts because sin is crouching at our doorstep always, seeking to get the best of us, even if sometimes nobody else realizes it. Because we don't show it. But it lives in our hearts. My dear friends, we're all imperfect people, capable of hurting each other. But we serve a God who defeated even death and said that the most permanent thing that we can ever comprehend, the only permanent thing that existed in all creation, and Jesus defeated it. There is no hurt that we can do to one another. that Jesus can cleanse, work in, and undo. But my friends, I want you to hear me from the tender response of my heart. As your pastor, as your brother in Christ, as your friend, what I didn't say was that that's okay to hurt each other. whether it's temporary or permanent. That while Jesus overcame death, He can overcome any hurt. It doesn't mean that it's okay. And it doesn't mean that it's ever right. Or that we celebrate. Jesus, I'm hurting today. Praise God. I don't expect that from you. We don't celebrate the hurt before. And it's never necessarily okay. But when our hearts are hurting, isn't it nice to know that that hurt doesn't have the last word? An empty tomb has the last word.